recording. Mm-hmm. All right, you're all set. All right. CP, the franchise, man. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate you, Absolutely, bro. Absolutely, man. Absolutely happy to be here. Yeah, man, you're always welcome on the show. We never done it in this setting before, yeah. but for real, thanks for being here. Um, what I love about your platform is I feel like with the Knicks, you bring in-depth analysis. I feel like everything revolving around the Knicks, partly because they were bad for so many years, has yeah. just been like the clickbait type stuff. Like, right, right. Dolan this, Charles Oakley that. Right. But I felt like what you did with it is really bring analysis to the game. Was that your vision with it going into it? Yeah, definitely, man. Like, I don't, I don't find the hot take stuff interesting. Right? It's why, you know, no disrespect to those guys. They've all blazed the trail, especially Stephen A and those guys. But I don't watch First Takes. I don't watch a lot of those shows, uh, you know, Skip and Shannon, even though I love Skip. I mean, I love Shannon. I love Shannon. You know, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll, I'll go look for his, his takes, his clips on the Internet because I think he's hilarious. But just as a whole, I just don't find those shows interesting. I don't learn anything from them. It's just hearing their opinion on things. And most of the times they want to be outlandish. Right. They want that sound bite. We never try to force that on our show. If it comes out, then it comes out. We'll put it out. Or if a fan has a crazy hot take, we'll put it out. But we never really just go for that, right? We just want to have honest basketball conversation. He's doing well. Here's why. He's not doing well. Here's why. Here's what we think he can do to get better, right? And so all of my guests that come on the show, they have that constructive analytical viewpoint on the game because I just don't feel like that other stuff to me I don't find it entertaining you know it's there everybody has their own lane like yeah. there is a lane for that but for me I just I want everything to just, just be authentic be natural if there are humorous parts that come out in the show so be it and we'll put it out but we just want to just be ourselves man we just let it flow is it a focus for you to stay level-headed because you know how crazy the Knicks fans could get I always feel like you're yeah. steady you'll never get too high and you'll never get too low yeah, that's just how that's just who I am, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just goes back to like I don't I don't want to be a forced personality. Right? Like I just want to be myself. That's this how you is, stay consistent, being yourself. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And and for some people, some people like I said, some people might like the outlandish, the brash, the loud, there's you know, there's a lane for that. Yeah. But then other people might take to what I do. So I just tap into those audience, that audience. And cultivate it from there. Growing up, what were your fondest memories of the Knicks? Because yeah. I, I don't think we ever talked about this before. We're always there's always there's always so much going on with the current Knicks. I never yeah. really got to hear your thoughts. What were like the things that really stuck up to stuck out to you growing up from not only a basketball point of view but from a media point of view? Yeah, from I mean from a media point of view, it's since it's playoff time. Like this is the time you could feel the energy. Like you yeah. could feel the energy around the city. Everybody was tapping into the Knicks back in those 90s days. You walk by a bar, you walk by a restaurant, everybody's locked in on the TV. You know, some of those fans have kind of died off in terms of their interest in, in today's game. But, like, back in those days, like, that was it. You didn't have a million sports shows. You didn't have Twitter. You didn't have 24-7 sports so that, talk, sports yeah. talk, sports talk. So what you did, you knew when the game was, Sunday at 1 o'clock. you waiting all week, and each day – you're reading the back pages, right? New York Post, New York Newsday for me, New York Daily News. And you're reading those articles that'll give you the news. That was it. Yeah. I, as you anticipate the game. They have it good now, right? Like, because Man. you don't really have to look too hard you to find to what you want. Every Everything is right in your eye. The, all your notifications going off, your bleach reports, your ESPNs, your YouTubes. Everything's just popping off. So you don't even have to look far. So I think, like, back in those days... The inform- when you got that information, it was, like, more valuable. Yeah. Because there just wasn't that many sources, so you appreciated it more. Like, remember um, when they used to do NBA and NBC, and they used to have the uh, the Prudential Halftime show, Peter Vesey would come on. That's, that's like the Woj of today. So Peter that's Vesey, right. you would get Peter Vesey once a week. Not like Woj is on NBA Today every single day yeah. giving you little tidbits. Peter Vesey come on once a week, five yeah. minutes, tell you the latest trade rumor, the latest with this, that, and the third. And that's it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was in the building recently for the Big East tournament. Yeah. And just seeing Patrick Ewan there, I feel like he doesn't get enough respect in the garden. Yeah. Now, I know it's college basketball, but you need to have some kind of tribute video or something. Yeah. I think part of it is because he's not around the organization like some of the other players of the past. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? It has to be, man. Even with the Big East. You know, yeah. This was, this was a Big East legend. Yeah. This is one of the greatest players to ever play the game, college or pro. Yeah. So he should be respected. He should be honored in that way. I just I hate the way things fell for him in, in with Georgetown. 
It's yeah. hard to recruit, man. It's hard to recruit and get those schools the rest of the year back up. You know, like a Patino at St. John's. We'll see what happens there, but. I didn't like how things went with with uh, you and Georgetown. He didn't take the easy route. Like coaching right. is not the easy route. Like he right. could have just been a media personality or a guy who hangs around the team. And I think yeah. he might have even been more beloved in that situation. But he's a competitive guy and he wanted to do it a little bit different. Yeah, but it's like when you lose, man. That then it's like it's a little another a little a little stain on the on the resume on the legacy. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why when Knicks fans are always like uh, the Knicks need to call you a new assistant coach. I'm like or head coach. <laughs> nah. No, no. He was no. a great player, but just, nah. Yeah, just leave him. I want those memories, not of him struggling as a coach to get the Knicks back on track. Yeah, and also I feel like, you know, when Reggie goes back to Indiana, they love him. You know how they love Dominique with the yeah. Hawks, Stockton, and Carl Malone with the Jazz. Yeah, I just yeah. feel like Ewing doesn't get that with the Knicks. He he doesn't, uh, and it's a shame because, you know, a lot of the, the memories that you have of him in that year, that era, was Jordan killing us. And then yeah. when Jordan left – not being able to capitalize because Elijah on the Rockets was so great. But we had our chance. <laughs> you know, you had a, you, your chances. Uh, the, the Knicks were up 3-2 in that series against Houston, man. You lost two excruciating games out there in Houston, lost the series, man. And then, you know, 99, it was more like a Cinderella story. I don't think anybody expected them to do much in that playoffs, uh, you know, run. But they were the AC, beat Miami, a rival beat Indiana, a rival, you know, went, made it to the finals, and then you come up against the beginning of another dynasty yeah. with, with the Duncan Popovich era, man. So, it, and, and during that run, he was hurt. Ewing was hurt. Yeah, and then he, like, he ended up in what, with the Sonics and Orlando. Yeah. yeah. Man, yeah. it was like seeing Hakeem in that Raptors jersey. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. It's never easy to say bye to your stars, man, and to see them moving on in those other jerseys, like, it's hard to accept. I, I wish he, I wish he got that same love, man. I, I really did. But you know, one of the things like you, know, you were asking about, like the memories from those years, it's, and it's something that you, you really don't get now as much. But it was the unscripted storytelling of yeah. those rivalries, man. The yeah. unscripted storytelling, you, you, you don't get that in, in today's NBA anymore. I mean, those things where that that were drawn out. When Riley had issues with the Knicks, ultimately goes to the Heat, builds a carbon copy of the Knicks, and then their rivals, they're brawling, they're beefing every year, every series, the suspensions, you know, those things, you can't make it up. Yeah. And those things were unfolding in front of our, our eyes live. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, you, you, those are the days, man. Speaking of rivalries, speaking of rivalries, yeah. do you ever feel that the Nets and the Knicks could become a legitimate rivalry? No. Nah, I, I don't see. It. You know what? You know what the part of the problem is? The yeah. Nets have no culture. Right, right. It's just the no, the culture is name chasing. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's like, let's just get this guy, that guy. And I think we've seen recently that the teams that build from the ground up just do better over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think it's uh you know with so much player movement as well, you, you don't really have time to have rivalries, right? When when Dinwiddie was with the Nets, it was possible. And then Katie and Kyrie come, then Dinwiddie's gone. Then Katie, Kyrie, and Harden are gone. You know, so it's always in flux. Now, I don't see anyone on the Nets that can really spark up a rivalry. They're all like mild mannered guys. You know what I mean? That like, is true, especially now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're all like mild mannered guys. I mean, maybe, maybe Dinwiddie will, will, could get it popping. We'll see. Because um, he usually likes to talk. You saw, you saw him and Kuzma were getting into it the other Hilarious, bro. They actually both they they get good grades from me from yeah. their trash talking, yeah. what they were doing against trash talkers. They were pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the rivalry is more between fans than the teams themselves. Yeah, it's more between fans. You know, the Nets fans they want that respect. You know, they're tired of being that little brother. They got the little Brooklyn Brigade fan club that they, they created over there. I think it's more between fans than the players themselves. Speaking of fans, you are Knicks fan TV. How are you feeling? How are the fans feeling about? This past season with the Knicks, and how would you grade yeah. the season? I graded it an A, man. Based wow, on okay. yeah, based on how they started and the turnaround, they went thirty-seven and twenty-two since December fourth, when they were ten and thirteen. Yeah, Tibbs shortens the rotation. He goes younger. He puts in McBride. There's no Rose. There's no Fournier. They're stuck on the bench. He gets Cam up out of here. He went with his guys. They continue to win. They went on like an eight-game winning streak since he made that change. They get Josh Hart at the at the trade deadline. He solidified the bench. Isaiah Hartenstein, who they got in the in, in the uh, previous offseason, he turned his season around. So everything just came together right for them. 
And even during that stretch, they had the third-ranked offense in the NBA. They finished fifth overall in offense. And so, you know, you got to give them a lot of credit, man, because they turned it around. They, yeah. they absolutely turned it around. They got the fifth seed, which was, I think, by a little bit of luck, I thought with the Nets being dismantled, it allowed the Knicks to move up. Because I thought if the Nets were, were still together, them and Cleveland would have had probably four or five. I think the Knicks would have been looking at six, around six. But yeah. nevertheless, they got five, man. I thought they had an outstanding year. Yeah, I think people have forgot about what was happening with Tibbs. I think there was like a report. He was yeah. telling people he thought he might get fired. But, you know, you said you stay true to yourself, and that's part of your success with what you do. And I think he stayed true to himself as well. Like, I love Cam Reddish's potential, but you could obviously tell he's not a Tibbs guy. Yeah. And bringing in a guy like Josh Hart, it's like this is a Tibbs guy, right. no matter what you think about him. Right, right. And all of a sudden when they got Josh Hart, like, before Josh Hart, there was always that uh, stigma on Tibbs, or he won't, he won't go small, he won't go small. As soon as he got Josh Hart, and you saw them against the Cavs in that last regular season matchup with no Julius Randle, Obi Toppin only played 19 minutes in that game. Yeah. Josh Hart got the bulk load of minutes, and a lot of that was at the four. So if you can play the way Tibbs wants you to play, he can adjust, but he's still stubborn in terms of his philosophy. I think that's where the stubbornness comes from. Do you feel he's confident in Toppin about being like a Tibbs type of guy? Like No. Okay. No, because he doesn't rebound and he doesn't play defense consistently enough. Is it that he Tibbs. doesn't play defense or he doesn't have the tools laterally to play defense? Because I remember covering him in the draft, like that was one of his weaknesses. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the lateral quickness is a bit of an issue, and it's overall awareness. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you watch how some of these guys play defense at like an IQ, a heart. You know, they always seem to be in the right spots. But if you could look at guys like an OB or even like an RJ, sometimes you see that they're a little bit out of sorts. So it's the mental side of things, too. I think, yeah, I think that is it as well. Yeah, who we haven't discussed yet is Jalen Brunson. And yeah. friend of the show, Doug Gottlieb, actually tweeted about him being an MVP. Mm. Do you feel like he should have been in the mix, get more MVP buzz? Because yeah. I didn't hear a lot of people talk about it. But, you know, the stats aren't obviously like some of those guys who are probably in the running to win it. But yeah. his impact has been immense. Incredible. And Julius was on that MVP ladder as well, but Brun Brunson wasn't on that ladder. Yeah. Um, but at the very least, if it's not MVP, I would definitely put him in the most improved player conversation, right? I mean, his, his, his stats went up on uh, almost across the board, mm -hmm. from points to assists, three-pointers, three-pointers attempted. He's been everything for this team. But I also think that, you know, it's not just a statistical jump, because if you did that, then marketing certainly has the edge. But you got to account, account for impact on the team. He changed the whole team around in, in Brunson because it was his play that made Julius Randle an all-star. Well, I truly believe because Randle didn't have to do everything that he had to do prior to Brunson, which is play, make, score, rebound. He had to be everything for the team. When Brunson comes in now, he took so much pressure off of Randle. He can just play his game. He can be a finisher. They can play off of each other in the two-man game. And then when it's crunch time, it's money time, you go to Brunson there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would have definitely had him in an MVP conversation, MIP conversation. And it's unfortunate, man, because he, he didn't make the all-star team. He's not going to be MVP or MIP, and he's probably not going to make an all-NBA team. But he had a great year, man. He turned this team around. Yeah. You know, another swing factor for the Knicks has been quickly. Yeah. He's my sixth man of the year. I think Brogdon definitely has a case as well. Not mad if anybody yeah. takes Brogdon. But what has been most impressive for you about his improvement? Yeah. Offense. Offense, shooting the ball efficiently. In his rookie year, it was almost floater, three-pointer, or nothing, right? Or he'll knock down his free throws, mm -hmm. but he didn't really have, like, an intermediate bag, mm -hmm. whether as a mid-range shooter, layups. He didn't have that much at all during his rookie year. And then he also – he shot the ball well from three, but under below the three-point line, he wasn't efficient at all from two. Last year, same way. It was kind of up and down shooting. This year, he's been on the money, man. He's yeah. been super efficient from the field. Shot selection is much better. You could just see the maturation in year three with quickly. Like, things have, like, completely slowed down, and now he's able to, like, take over in games. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's been incredible, man. Quickly's yeah. been incredible. He, I, he would get my vote for sixth man of the year because, again, like, I got to factor in overall impact on the team. Like, if Quickly's not on that bench, this team is not good. Yeah. They're not nearly as good if he's not on that bench. Brogdon, Brogdon's a great player. I thought he was going to be uh, good for the Celtics. Good pickup if he stayed healthy. I thought he would have been a great pickup for them. The shooting efficiencies is off the charts. 
But yeah. I'm just like, did they really need him to be the Celtics? I don't know. That's the thing. Also, I feel like Brogdon is a better basketball player as of yeah. quick, a better basketball player than quickly right now. But I would say quickly had some bigger moments, right? Uh-huh. That and winning awards is about moments. Yeah, quick had big moments, man. Yeah, look at it in that double overtime game against the Celtics. Yeah, incredible, in- yeah. incredible. And that's the thing about quick is like his impact was there as a starter and off the bench. You know what I mean? And then if you look at the defensive numbers, whether you're looking at the eye test or you're looking at the analytics, Quickly's impact on defense is on off numbers, especially was way, to me way better than Brogdon. How do you feel about RJ's development? Slow, <laughs> slow. Yeah, it has been good this year, man. Yeah. You know, um, what do you what do you fact What are the factors that that I look at? It could be a lot of things. You know, how much did the did the Mitchell trade? Rumors impact him. A lot of people were questioning whether he played enough basketball this year. I don't know. I don't. You mean in the off season? In the off season, I wasn't there. I don't know. You know what I mean? But he people, did look a little out of shape in the beginning. Yeah. Right. People did question that, but again, I can't. I don't know. I don't know what his off season regimen is. So, I, so it's hard to really put that on. What there. you do in private shows in public. That's fair. That that's certainly fair. Yeah. But but you know he he's always based on who you talk to, and I talked to a lot of people for, on his team. They always compliment him on, on his work ethic. Okay. Yo, he's always in the gym. He's not looking to do this. He's not looking for extracurricular. When we're trying to go to the club, he's trying to get in the gym. They say he's a gym rat. So that's all I They have a few of those on this team, I realize. Yeah. 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 Like, Brunson definitely feels like that type of guy. Yeah. Randall's a guy who I feel like he idolizes Kobe a little bit, yeah. if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And he's like that type of guy as well. Yeah. Randall's always in the gym. That's one yeah. thing you, you can say about Julius is that in his offseason, he's coming in the best shape. Yes. You know, he's, he's coming in the best shape. But for RJ, like, was there an adjustment period to, to playing off of Julius and Brunson? Maybe. But when you look at his overall game, the shooting just hasn't been there. You know, 31% from three this year. It's been so up and down. And then the defense took a step back. I thought his defense from his rookie year has gotten a little, little, little bit worse. You know, there were games in his rookie year we were looking at RJ, you know, look how well he defended Kawhi Leonard and – the way he was playing, but this year, I mean, guys are blowing right past him. He's always been susceptible to backdoor plays, and he just hasn't been locked in, and he hasn't been connected. And that's why you see in the fourth quarter in certain games, he's not even closing games. It's quickly, it's hard, maybe even Grimes. We'll see in, in the Cleveland series because his defense just hasn't been on, on, on point. Yeah. And, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that Progression's not only – it's not linear, right? Development's not linear. But when people look at the fact that he got the contract, they see quickly now taking a big leap in year three. Brunson's killing. Can, can quickly Julius become that third guy, you think? Yeah, but he could be off the bench like a Ginobili. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see – this team could change, right? But I don't necessarily see quick right. as a starting two guard for the team. I think his role – as that jack of all trades, come off the bench, close games. I think it's important. Yeah. Just like Ginobili was to the Spurs, man. Most definitely. CP, it is playoff time. Yeah. What do you feel like the biggest storylines are for this yeah. series between the Cavs and the Knicks? Julius is health. Mm. I, he's got to be healthy and he's got to be ready to go for them to have a chance. You know what I mean? Because against this Cavs defense, the way they get after it in the half court with the Twin Towers there, you got to get physical with them, for one. you got to get on the boards. They're not an overall good rebounding team, but with the Twin Towers, they, they can, you know, cause some problems. Uh, you need Julius out there to get physical with Mobley. You also need his three-point shooting to help space the floor a little bit, draw Mobley away from the basket so he's not, you know, just kind of just roaming as a free safety to protect the rim. And you just overall, you need Julius as a shot creator next to Brunson that can get it for you in the, in the half court. If he's not healthy to me, I don't, I don't think they have a chance. Are there any updates? I, you, you know, uh, Tibbs had that little smirk at the end of his – He uh, had that little smirk, right? <laughs> uh, but then they said as of, as of Tuesday, we're recording this on, on Thursday now, that uh, he still hasn't been clear for contact. We're supposed to be getting Ooh. an update later on today or maybe any minute now. But he hasn't been clear for contact. He's doing light running and shooting. So it's kind of up in the air, man. Maybe it's just a game-time decision. Yeah, the Cavs have been the better basketball team the whole year. Yeah. 
as good as Jalen Brunson is, I feel like they have the best basketball player on the team. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Julius Health is definitely one of the X factors. Yeah. What are some other keys for the Knicks yeah. going into the series? Shooting three. In the regular season matchup against the Cavs, they shot 39% from three. But if the Cavs are going to do what they do best, which is wall off the paint, which is the, the Knicks' key strengths, right? You, you can't take away everything. But one of the things that the Knicks do great, which is Brunson, Julius, RJ, is get into the paint and score from there. But if the Cavs take that away, then the Knicks are going to have to find a way to get some three-pointers and, and knock those down when they get those opportunities because the Cavs are also good at limiting three-point attempts and three-pointers made. But you can shoot it efficiently against them when you get your opportunity. So it's going to be very important for Grimes, even an RJ, quickly, topping. they got to be able to knock down the three in the series. Which big man do you trust more in the clutch, yeah. I Hart or Mitchell? Right now, Hartenstein's trending upwards. I would say that. I, it's almost like trading offense for defense, right? Yes, yes. I think for Mitch, his ability to offensive rebound is still better than Hartenstein. It's the best in the league next to Steven Adams. You're going to need that. But I think Hartenstein is showing you that he's been get, able to get it done on both sides of the floor now. He's not a liability like he was on defense and getting defensive rebounds. That was one of the knocks on him when he came from the Clippers, is that he couldn't get a, he couldn't get a defensive board and his defense was kind of spotty. He wasn't disciplined, so he's always in foul trouble. He's cleaned that up. And then offensively now, he's more sure-handed than Mitch, and now you can run some sets with him at the top of the key, at the high post. Yeah. You got guys running back door. You know, so now you have one through five, potentially when, when Hartenstein is out there, as capable playmakers for each other, keep the offense run because you got to move that ball against the Cavs in the half court. And so with Hartenstein, he's just a little bit more sure-handed, a little bit better free throw shooter right now than Mitch. But they're both going to be important in this series. It gives you more of like five threats on offense, especially as, you know, dribble pass shooters, right? I mean, I Hart's right. not a big-time shooter. Right. but Capable. He, yeah, but he's like one of – like he would fit well in like a Warriors-type system, make a read, react. Yes. He's, he almost does like some Draymond-ish type stuff right. on the court. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And and you're starting to see that more. You know, early in the year, it was kind of a struggle to yeah. get into Tibbs' role. But later in the year, like I remember there, there was a big West Coast, the second, the last West Coast trip that they took – and they were taking on, like, Sabonis with the Kings, Anthony Davis with the Lakers, Nurkic with the Blazers. And Mitch was having a tough go, man. He was, he was a little winded out there. They were kind of getting the best of him. Hartenstein did a commendable job. Then they came home. They played the Nuggets. They played Jokic. Yeah. Hartenstein, he, he wasn't bad, man. Yeah. He, he, he did a commendable job out there. Yeah. Cavs, heavy pick and roll team. What do you think this team should focus on defensively when it comes to playing against the Cavs? Man, you can't stop the spider, man. Yep. You know what I mean? You, you can't stop the spider. You can only hope to slow him down. I think Grimes is going to have a tall order in front of him because Grimes, is a, he's an aggressive defender. And Spider, having that experience, having that playoff experience, uh, you've seen it in the regular season in their matchup. He knows how to use that against Grimes, especially with playing against the refs. You're going to be home. You're going to get the benefit of the whistle. So that's going to be a little bit tough. I think I'm going to force them to, to knock down some outside shots, man. Like if Spider has it cooking – you might have to throw some doubles at him and, and let these other guys beat you. You can't let him rip off five, ten points in a row, get that crowd going, get the momentum, because he's capable of, of ripping those off. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? yeah. Yeah, and then at, at the same time, like, the Knicks also do a good job of protecting the paint. So their three-point defense is, is definitely going to have to be on point. But if you can get it out of Mitchell's hands – if you get it to – or Vert can be a streaky shooter at times. A Mobley can be a streaky shooter at times. If you if you try to make those guys beat you, then I think you're going to have a better chance because you, you're not going to stop Mitchell or even Garland for that matter. Yeah, I don't know if your fan base is going to attack you for this one, but I want a little role reversal. What do you feel like the keys mm -hmm. for the Cavs are to win this series? Because I always think that's an interesting way to look at things, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think they also have to take their chances with the Knicks at, at three. Okay. Because you just don't know. Grimes, this is Grimes' first go in the playoffs. RJ's been so up and down as a shooter, right? We know Brunson's claim to fame is getting into that paint and scoring over those bigs, but if he's got, like, an Okoro on him, you know, they're going to funnel them into that paint where Allen and Mobley is. They're going to make it very hard on him, especially yeah. if Okoro plays. We're still not sure with him either. 
he's, I think an, they need he's an X factor. I mean, I actually talked. I actually talked about this with C.J. Watson way back. Like, he's a guy that if he's knocking down the three, the future for the Cavs is very bright. Right, right. Yeah, because his defense, he's gonna play Brunson very tough, man. And so I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna really key in on him. He scored forty eight points on him in that regular season finale. JB Bickerstaff said, "Yeah, that that really woke us up." They're gonna take that ball out of his hands and make everybody else beat him. And if Julius isn't healthy, that'll play into the Cavs' hands. I feel like an optimistic way to look at it about it for the Knicks fans is that with Mitchell and Garland, their two best offensive players, they're very pick and roll centric, yeah. and the two best players for the Knicks, their scoring is more diversified. Right. Yeah. 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 And especially with, with Garland and Mitchell, the thing is, is that when the Knicks are going to that drop coverage, they can kill you in the mid range as well. Right. So this it's, it's three level threats, or almost four, when you think about throwing a lob over the top to an Allen and a Mobley, because yeah. they can, they can give it to you in waves, man. So it's a, it's a tough cover. So you know, I mean, Stephen A. Obviously, you you mentioned him earlier. He's yeah. been talking about how like if this is the team you lose to in the playoffs, I'm paraphrasing yeah. here, yeah. that the season is not a success. Yeah. Do you feel the same way? No. Okay. I feel like if they keep it competitive and lose and like if it's Six, seven games seven, or something. Yeah. I thought it was a good series season overall. Do you think – I mean, you know the Knicks fan base yeah. better than anybody. Do you think yeah. they'll feel that way? It depends on how the series goes. Okay. If they get washed, they will feel the same. They will feel like it was a blown season. If yeah. they get washed, because they'll feel like everything that they worked for was for nothing. A gentleman sweep, same way. Like, you can't go out like you did against the Hawks and completely just choke it away. Especially now this is a better team than what they came in with two years ago. This is a way better team, a way deeper team. You know, quickly's taking the jump. Julius is better. They have Brunson now. They have a closer. They have better shooters. They have Hart. You know, the team the team is way deeper, way better than they were two years ago. They have that Mitch. They have a healthy Mitch and yeah. Augustine. Yet you have two bigs now. So it, it's a vastly different team than they had. Tips has some the decisions Hawks. to make, right? Big time. Big yeah. time. Yeah. When you factor in the center rotation, and of that, quickly, R.J. Grimes, Hart. Which one of the two? Are you playing in crunch time? Who are you going with your top eight in terms of minutes? Top eight? Uh, the starting five, Brunson, RJ Grimes, Julius, Mitch. And then off the bench, it'll be uh, it'll be Hart, quickly, Hartenstein. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yep. then, you know, Obi will find his minutes here and there. But if Julius is healthy, that, that would be the eight. So we got to hear your prediction right here on Cabo's court. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know mine first. Yeah. As I said, I feel like the Cavs have the best player. They've been the better team all year. Yeah. You know, the Knicks have won the matchups. Yeah. And yeah. Brunson has showed he could torch them. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go Cavs in seven. Mm. Cavs in seven. And I want your unbiased mm. opinion, CP. Your unbiased I'm, opinion. I'm keeping it consistent, man. I'm going Knicks in six. Okay. I'm counting on Julius to come back, have a strong series. Brunson as well. And the Knicks bench, to me, is the X factor. They, they have a better bench, a deeper bench than the Cavs. Levert can get it going. Don't get me wrong. Levert can get it popping. Chetty Osman can get it going from three. Yes. They definitely have some guys you got to key in on. But the Knicks defense coming off their bench, that's what, that's what I like. And then you're going to have guys coming at Spider in waves. We'll see. You know, one thing about Spider is that he doesn't shoot well on the road. Okay. So how will the bright lights of MSG and the crowd of MSG – it could go one of two ways. It might turn him into a fifty-point scorer, <laughs> or yeah, maybe, maybe he might get feel feel some jitters, man. Yeah, I feel like Levert is definitely an X factor. Like I talked about this with the Kings. Like Malik Monk is their most obvious X yeah. factor, and yeah. Levert is the same way. But you know, Levert even has a higher level peak than like even a Malik Monk because he has played at an All Star level in the right, past. Like right. we've seen it in the bubble, we've yeah. seen it in the Nets, yeah. and you never know when Karis Levert could just win you a ball game. Yeah, he has way more of a shot creation back then than Monk. Yeah, and like over his last ten, he's shooting damn near fifty percent from three. He was cooking to finish the season. Yeah. So that's one thing I worry about because when they put those three guards out there, you can't hide Brunson and RJ. They yeah. got a guard. Yeah. And that's another thing. I got to see how Tibbs, you got to manage those timeouts well because you might have to go offense, defense. I'm, I'm subbing Brunson out for defense and going quickly, Grimes, and Hart. I'm not, I can't take chances, bro. Yeah. You got to throw different looks sometimes for got sure. Got to. Got to. Man. So, CP, no matter what happens in this series, how do you yeah. feel the Knicks are positioned? moving forward as a franchise? I think they're positioned well. When you look at the impact that Brunson has had on this team, Randall as well, 
They've taken the next jump. They still have a bevy of draft picks to work with. They have some flexibility in terms of, you know, they, they are at the salary cap, but they do have some wiggle room in terms of making trades. I think they position themselves very well. We'll see what happens with the Dallas pick. They may have a draft pick in the lottery this year, Ooh, along with making I like the playoffs. Draft too. So they, they have options. They, they have options. You know, a lot of uh, there was a lot of worry, especially coming into the season, that they may be stuck in no man's land based on how this team is. This team, if this team is a mediocre team or or worse, they could be stuck. Yeah. But you saw some positive signs. Again, Brunson's impact. Quickly's emergence, they're going to take care of him in the offseason. Hart's going to be back. They have some some pieces here. It's just they still need, a, they still need another guy to, to get it popping. The no man's land thing is interesting, and even more so this season because yeah. of Wemby. Because if you have a chance to get better and you don't, I feel like the basketball gods won't look good upon you. Yeah. 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 It's tough, man. Yeah. It's tough. Toughest business to win a championship. I yeah. always say it's the NBA, man. Yeah, CP. So tell about forty forty. You know, yeah. I actually pulled up to a forty forty event led by CP, and it's one thing getting you know views and likes on social yeah. media, but to be able to pack out forty forty like you did, out. bro, that was. Imp- yeah. I told you that that night. Like yeah. that's impressive stuff. That's yeah. like a bigger in- impact than anything you could probably do on social because this is in real life, yeah. real people coming into a venue. So, yeah. um, I appreciate everything you do and uh, tell us where we could. Find tickets for that. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, KFTVPlayoffs.com. Uh, we'll be doing watch parties for game one and game two. Uh, we will have watch parties for three and four as well at, at uh, another location. But, you know, just stay tuned for that. Just stay up with us on, on YouTube.com slash KnicksFanTV. We'll have updates on everything. But for tickets, go to KFTVPlayoffs.com. CP, thank you so much for taking the time. You're always yeah, welcome back on the show and talk soon. Absolutely, bro. Appreciate it, bro. Yes, sir. Thanks, bro. Yeah, there it was, man. Yeah, no 